Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Trust and Believe. I'm your host, Sean T. And today, we're going to be talking about something that makes a lot of people very uncomfortable. And to be quite honest, I don't think a lot of people have even talked about your pelvic floor and all of the things surrounding that. Some of y'all probably don't even know what that is. But today, we have an incredible guest. His name is Lance Frank. Not only is he super intelligent, but he's super nice. He has an incredible smile, and he makes talking about the genital area feel really great. Get ready to trust and believe. Somebody say hey, yeah. no, no, no. What's up? It's better than Oprah. Come on, y'all. This is Sean T, and it's time to trust and believe. Let's. What's up? What's up? How what's are up, you? I'm good. How are you? I'm Thank wonderful. All right, I'm going to dive right in. We can <laughs> okay. we can chat about fun stuff outside of the podcast. But can you tell everyone about you and just dive right into the pelvic floor? Let's get into it. <laughs> sure. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Lance Frank. I'm a I'm a physical therapist. I live in Atlanta. Um, and I specialize in pelvic floor disorders. Um, so pelvic floor, as you can imagine, is a group of muscles that lives in the base of your pelvis. So think of a, a trampoline or a hammock. They kind of hold all of the abdominal contents and the pelvic organs kind of in place. And they have responsibilities for urinary or urinary function, bowel function, sexual function, and then just kind of overall supportive roles. So that's kind of my specialty. Everything I tell everyone kind of below the rib cage and above the knees is is what I specialize in. You mean you don't just say <laughs> below the belt? I mean, hello. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> just a little joke. So, all right, here's the thing. I want to know what made you want to specialize in the pelvic floor and what was your schooling like? Like, how, how was that different than, you know, what maybe other uh, physical therapists would go through? Yeah. So... I sort of stumbled into pelvic health. I, you know, I went into PT school thinking that I was going to work with athletes and like high level, you know, athletics. I, like I have a, a sports background, super into ortho and all through PT school. I, you know, that was my plan. I was going to graduate and work with athletes. And then in, you know, for PT school, you have to do clinical rotations and they're four months long. And so for my orthopedic rotation, I had a, an instructor who was a dual. She treated ortho, but she also treated pelvic health. Um, like half of her caseload, eh, most of her caseload was ortho, but she would have random, you know, sporadic pelvic health patients. And she sort of introduced me to the world of pelvic health. And it, it, long story short, after our, my clinical, she offered, she was leaving where we were at together to open up her own clinic. And she offered me a job to come work with her. And She's like, you know, I, I really think that you would be a great therapist. I want you to work with me, but I need you to have a niche. Like you have to have a niche specialty and so that we can market you. Um, and she was like, have you ever considered pelvic health? She's like, there aren't many men that treat pelvic floor. Um, and I was like, absolutely not. Never, ever crossed my mind to treat pelvic right. floor. But I was like, you know, I'm open to it. So I went and I took my first course in pelvic floor the semester that I was about to graduate. And after that, I was like, whoa, like it just opened up a whole new world. Cause in pelvic air in PT school, it's a three-year program. It's a three-year clinical doctorate. And so in my entire program, we had one lecture over pelvic floor dysfunction and it was mostly pertaining to women around birth, you know, prenatal postpartum. And that was really all we got. And so I went to this first class and, and when I was about to graduate this first course, and they were talking about, you know, all the things that can go wrong with your pelvic floor and how they can impact not only women, but also men and, you know, everyone. And so when I learned about it, I was like, holy crap, like <laughs> there's this, there's this whole population of people that isn't having their needs met, particularly men or people with penises. Like, and so I, I kind of went with it. I was like, got really into it. I went down this pelvic health rabbit hole and learned all I could in a very short amount of time and started 
treating it and it's it makes me use my brain differently than I would in in a typical orthopedic or any other setting kind of setting yeah it challenges me in a, in a different way and I, I really enjoy that all right so there are people listening and they may be sitting home or wherever they are and they've been kind of struggling with a pain or issue in their pelvic floor or they know a friend that's been complaining to them but they have no idea that somebody likes <laughs> like you exists right and they're just kind of feeling this thing or certain things are happening. So tell us what are some symptoms or some issues that show up in women and men. So if they're listening to this or if they know someone that has been kind of talking about some sort of symptoms they had, you know, how, why they should take it seriously and possibly go see their doctor or somebody like you. So I'll preface that question with a statement that I, I tell everyone, you know, just because something is common doesn't mean that it's normal. And, mm -hmm. you know, the prime example is peeing yourself, particularly women, whenever they're, you know, working out, jumping, jump rope. Like, I know you do a lot of plyometrics, so I'm sure a lot of your no, athletes yeah. are leak themselves. And it's just kind of a, a something that they kind of keep to themselves anyways. So laughing, coughing, sneezing, you know, leaking with any kind of pressure system is not it's very common but it's not normal and it's not something that people have to live with um so pelvic pain pain with ejaculation or orgasm or um, pain with penetration is another big one a lot of people just kind of suffer silently and think that you know everyone has pain with sex or pain with penetration and that's absolutely it's very very common but it's not normal um and that is one that I see in both genders, you know, whether you're having vaginal intercourse or anal intercourse, penetration shouldn't be painful. Um, and so that's one where I always get a lot of raised eyebrows. But again, common does not equal normal. Um, so a lot of pain symptoms, but also things like premature ejaculation or erectile dysfunction. I work closely with a lot of urologists and proctologists and gastroenterologists, all kinds of doctors that deal with the pelvis. I have a lot of them on speed dial. And if you've been ruled out for any serious medical underlying condition, typically it's, it can be attributed to a musculoskeletal dysfunction or muscles essentially. And that's my specialty. That's what I work on. Doctor physicians don't, you know, a lot of times they'll run a lot of diagnostic tests, they'll prescribe a lot of medications, um, they'll get you to the person that can help you can help you. Um, but I'm the one that deals with, you know, the muscle dysfunction aspect of it. Um, and so yeah, erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, um, a lot of conditions like endometriosis, or polycystic ovarian syndrome, interstitial cystitis, um, if a patient has, you know, has prostate cancer and they've had their prostate radiated or removed, um, I deal, I treat a lot of patients that are cancer survivors or have, you know, scar tissue in the pelvis. Um, any kind of pelvic surgery that you've had, scar tissue can really impact the way our muscles, you know, function, especially in a vaginal canal or a rectal canal. Um, it can really impede mobility in general. So I, I treat a lot of that. Peri, you know, peripartum, prenatal, postpartum patients, also people who have delivered babies, whether it's vaginally or through a C-section. Still, I would argue, and I would go, I will go to my grave arguing this, every patient that delivers a baby should be automatically given a prescription to pelvic floor therapy. But it's the standard in Europe and a lot of European countries, you know, you give a baby or you have a baby, your doctor writes you a prescription for six weeks of pelvic floor PT. It's just kind of like the gold standard over there. Oh. We're still a little lacking over here in the States. For some reason, we, we, the, a lot of physicians think what we do is witchcraft. <laughs> it's just like voodoo. Not yeah, like, a lot that's of, not, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that you don't need that. Just do a bunch of Kegels. And that is absolutely not true. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a whole list, you know, constipation, fissures, hemorrhoids, um, I do help with, you know, IBS symptoms, irritable bowel syndrome. If patients have excessive diarrhea or excessive constipation, a lot of times the pelvic floor can be 
involved in that. I'm not going to say pelvic floor therapy will cure the IBS, but it'll help with help manage the symptoms. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I could, I could talk this whole podcast about diagnoses well, that I treat. <laughs> no, that's great. But I actually want to actually want to dive into a couple of them pretty intensely. Sure. The first one being women who, you know, pee themselves during exercise. And I'll tell you this, I have heard countless times women saying, I can't do power jumps without peeing. Or women who were actually working out in my workouts. They're like, oh my God, I peed myself doing a workout. And, you know, they're all laughing about it. They do share it because they're in a space of other women who've had babies that are doing it. And they, like you said, they just accept it. So that's the, I'm going to talk about more, but that's the first thing I want to talk about. Why should they not just accept that? And in addition to that, what is the most common thing that's making that happen. So these people can actually, you know, go get some physical therapy for it, or at least we can push them in the right direction. I guess I should also say patients, even patients who haven't had a baby, haven't delivered, still have the urinary incontinence with, it, it's called stress urinary incontinence. You're putting stress on your body and it causes you to leak. Um, but, you know, it, you don't have to j have, you don't have to have a baby to have stress urinary incontinence. In fact, a lot of patients that I see actually haven't had a baby and it's, I can go down a rabbit hole as to why, but essentially the pelvic floor muscles, you, when you think of pelvic floor dysfunction, you can basically break it down into two groups. So you have a group that's an overactive pelvic floor, meaning that the, the pelvic floor muscles are kind of in a locked up state. They're, they're contracted so tightly that they've lost their ability or they have a decreased ability to relax and lengthen. And then you also have an underactive pelvic floor kind of side of things where those patients typically have a weakened pelvic floor. They're either peri, you know, prenatal postpartum, or they're of the menopausal age where just because of hormones or because of the trauma of giving birth, the pelvic floor muscles are in a weakened state. So mm -hmm. to further complicate things, even both camps are essentially have a weak pelvic floor. One is so, so contracted, so tightly wound that it is, we call it in therapy, we call that weak. Because if you think mm -hmm. of doing a bicep curl, if you grab a bite or if you grab a dumbbell and you're trying to do a bicep curl in this position, you're not going to be able to lift very much weight. You have to go through the full range of motion of your elbow. Your, your bicep has to be able to, con to contract and relax to move that, that amount of weight. The mm -hmm. same principle applies to the pelvic floor. The muscles have to be able to contract and relax to perform their functions. Um, and obviously with the underactive pelvic floor, they've just been through either whether it's hormones or whether it's been through the trauma of a, of a, a vaginal delivery, those muscles have to regain their strength. They're, they're what we call, um, they're just underactive. They're just weak. Um, so on that aspect of patients, I do a lot of strengthening. On the other side, the overactive camp, we do a lot of down training and learning how to uh, neuromuscular control, connecting your brain with your body and figuring out how to control it. So learning, teaching those patients how to get out of this overactive contracted state and learn how to relax their pelvic floor through different things like different stretches, different breathing techniques, um, a lot of manual techniques that patients can do at home, but also manual techniques that I help with in the clinic. Um, so, but back to your initial question, the, the patients that are, are leaking themselves in your workout classes, it's even though, like I said, it's common, it's not normal. And it's basically with those patients, well, all patients really, it could be, it's attributed to a pressure, a pressure distribution issue. So hmm. your pelvic floor responds and is best friends with your diaphragm. Your diaphragm is the muscle that helps us breathe. So you're, whenever you take a big breath in, your diaphragm pulls your lungs down, the lungs inflate, the diaphragm gets pulled down, all of your abdominal contents and everything in your abdominal cavity gets pushed down on top of the pelvic floor. And the pelvic floor- I'm doing floor, this exercise right now, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and if everything is you know, working appropriately, the pelvic floor should be able to lengthen and to accommodate all of that pressure, all of the things getting pushed down on top of it, like a trampoline or a hammock, the pelvic floor should be able to expand to accept all of that pressure. And then when you exhale, 
the pelvic floor should gently contract as the diaphragm rises, the abdominal content shift upward, the pelvic floor should, should gently contract. So you have this piston mechanism, everything kind of moves down, moves up and down in sync. What I see in the clinic a lot of times is when that mechanism gets flip flopped or for whatever reason gets thrown out of whack. And a lot of times the patients that I see have that kind of stuck or contracted or overactive pelvic floor. And so their diaphragm is constantly pushing down on top of this, of this, you know, concrete floor. It's not giving any, it's not giving any room for anything to move. And so whenever patients, whether it's jumping or, you know, laughing, coughing, sneezing, that pressure, all of that air gets pushed down on top of the pelvic floor and that air has to escape some way. So it's either going to escape through your mouth or through your pelvic floor. And a lot of times, nine times out of 10, it escapes through the pelvic floor. So that's where you see things like leaking and teaching patients how to breathe. Literally, it sounds so silly, but retraining the way that people breathe is, has honestly one of the greatest treatment techniques that I have, because if you can figure out how to redistrib redistribute that pressure system so that all of the air is coming out of your mouth and not through the pelvic floor, you know, urinary incontinence is, it's a relatively easy thing to treat once you get that system, you know, figured out. But a lot of times patients have no idea what their pelvic floor is. They have, they've never had to draw their attention to it. They just know that there's genitals down there. And so a lot of times patients haven't ever had to think about what their pelvic floor is doing every time they jump or laugh or cough or sneeze. And so a lot of, a lot of what I do is just mental awareness and breathing. <laughs> it sounds really simple, but whenever you're, you know, whenever you put it into practice, it's actually kind of hard if you've never drawn your attention to your pelvic floor and what it's doing at any given time. <laughs> Have you ever worked with um, any vocal coaches? Because I wonder if it's the same type of breathing. Because when I when I do vocal training, it's it sounds a very similar breathing. Like a lot of people breathe upward with their chest, and I think if they were to breathe correctly, it would kind of enhance what you're teaching people to do. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. I um, I just had this conversation with a patient this morning. I he was also. Um, um, he was an actor and did a lot of voice training and the, the way that I was teaching him to breathe, he was like, this feels very similar to when I was, you know, singing and going through my vocal coaching. Um, but anyways, yeah, no, a lot of what I see, we live in a very high stress, anxious society. And so in a, in a physical manifestation, patients present with a lot of upper chest breathing, you know, fast, rapid breathing that doesn't really get much lower than their chest. Whenever I'm teaching what it's called diaphragmatic breathing, breathing with your diaphragm, whenever I'm teaching diaphragmatic breathing, I'm, you know, if you imagine your rib cage is an umbrella, I'm teaching patients expand, make your ribs expand from front to back, from side to side. Imagine breathing through a straw and filling up your pelvic bowl full of air. Your, your belly should expand. The air should almost be not pushed, but, you know, breathed into your pelvis. And with that increase in pressure into the abdominal cavity, a lot, it's, it's really easy to get that pelvic floor expansion whenever you've been kind of stuck like this for a long time. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't work directly with vocal coaches, but I, I had patients in the past, whether it's theater or I had an opera singer once, um, a lot of actors here in Atlanta, it, I, I hear that a lot. It's like whenever I have saying in the past or have been trying to project my voice more that a lot of instructors or coaches will, you know, breathe or teach to breathe through the diaphragm. And it's very similar to what I teach. I have to call out this song that was made and it goes, I don't want no men and men. And I'm like, after meeting you, I'm like, why are these singers? I'm not going to call out the singing group, but why are they shading Minutemen? Because premature ejaculation can be helped right and so i first want to say if you're a guy out there and you have premature ejaculation don't be embarrassed by it i'm sure dr lance is going to help us check this uh, talk about this but can we talk about this because this is something that so many men are they're teased about or they have a lot of um you know insecurities about 
And I'll tell you, if me and Scott don't have sex for a long time, I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, listen, I don't know how long you want this to go for. But, you know, and that's that's purely because, but I just, right. you know, for me, it's important. You right. know, so let's talk about premature ejaculation. Can we please? <laughs> yes, yes, please. Um, <laughs> so premature ejaculation, it it's tricky, right? So a lot of times it's correlated to, you know, sexual performance. So let me back up. I also work closely with a lot of sex therapists, mental health therapists that specialize in sexual health. And so probably my biggest referral sources are urologists and sex therapists. So for men, sex therapists who are seeing a sex therapist, a lot of times there's a, there's a psychological aspect to it. There's um, performance anxiety. And if this has been something that you've been dealing with for a while, it's, you're, it's, you're going to have a lot of anxiety surrounding it. But like I said earlier, a lot of my overactive pelvic floor patients have anxiety. They have an overactive pelvic floor. And from the mental health side of things, they have anxiety. They're very stressed. They're likely depressed. Um, not likely. A lot of times are also have depression. So it's that overactive pelvic floor state. So an ejaculation, the way an ejaculation happens is, you know, among other physiological processes, mm -hmm. an ejaculation is sparked by rapid rhythmic contractions of your pelvic floor, particularly the muscles of the penis. Um, and so when those muscles have to contract that fast, it goes back to this bicep analogy. If, if you're on a threshold where if, if 90% is where you live, if a 90% contraction is where you live and a hundred percent contraction gets you to an orgasm or ejaculation, your threshold to get there doesn't take very long. Whereas if you have an overactive or if you, if you don't have an overactive pelvic floor and you live at around a 30% contraction, which is where people should live 20 to 30%, it doesn't, it takes much longer to get to that 100% full muscle contraction buildup. It's a, a very typical clinical presentation of someone with premature ejaculation. They have an overactive pelvic floor and they hold their breath a lot. And as we just talked about, diaphragmatic breathing is very important for pelvic floor muscle relaxation. And so if you're constantly holding your breath and you already have an overactive pelvic floor, it's like a split second to get to, to get an orgasm. Because as we talked about before, exhaling or holding your breath correlates with a muscle contraction, the contraction phase of, you know, that contract relax. And so a lot of times what I see, I'll ask patients like the next time you have sex, like pay attention to whether or not you're holding your breath. And a lot of times they come back and they're like, yeah, I took like two breaths the entire time we were having sex. And so it, wow. yeah, people just like their diaphragms get locked up and their pelvic floors get locked up. And so if an orgasm happens by rapid rhythmic muscle contractions, it, it just, the threshold to get there is a lot, a lot less, I'll say. Um, so for premature ejaculation, among, you know, other things, a lot of what I teach them is you know, breathe, how to breathe and how to relax their pelvic floor and a lot of external and internal techniques to, you know, release their pelvic floor muscles. So they're not constantly in this like chronically held tense state. Um, Can I ask you a question with that yeah. real quick? Because I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm a keep it real kind of guy. So that to me <laughs> seems like the opposite of what you should do. And I'm sure you probably heard this before, because think about if you have to hold your pee, one of the things you do is you, you know, clasp, right? But you're saying you should relax. And I think that a lot of people who may, because I think about like, if I'm about to have an orgasm, you think, oh, I need to try to hold this in. So how, like, what is the science behind actually, I mean, I know you kind of talked about it, but I, I want to know a little bit deeper is why now relax that space when you feel like something's going to escape that space. Does that make sense? Are you, you're, and you're still talking about ejaculation? Yeah, I'm talking about ejaculation. Cause like, I mean, I don't know, or I guess maybe the question is, is holding your pee 
and holding your ejaculation for men the same? Like, is that the same, you know, cause it's, I don't know. No, it's not the same. And okay, I guess so that's what makes sense for your ejac for the ejaculation. It just kind of depends on what your goal is. Like if you're trying to have an orgasm or if you're trying to ejaculate, then yeah, like go for it. Like squeeze your pelvic floor muscles all day long. That's going to enhance your orgasm. It's going to enhance your, the ejaculation. It's, it if if you're wanting to have an orgasm contracting your pelvic floor isn't a bad thing however if we're talking purely about premature ejaculation and wanting to prolong how long or you know prolong that ejaculation process then yeah i i want you to be relaxing your pelvic floor i want you to be focusing on breathing however when you get to a point where you and your partner are ready to finish to orgasm to get off that's when i'm like then yeah you know start contracting your pelvic floor again because an orgasm is triggered by those rhythmic contractions of the pelvic floor so but in terms of urination or you know going to the bathroom for well for both genders whenever you're peeing you have an internal urethral sphincter and an external urethral sphincter and so the external urethral sphincter is one that we have voluntary control over. We can actually, you know, do a pelvic floor contraction. You squeeze the pelvic oh. floor and that one, that one can close off. The internal urethral sphincter isn't necessarily one that we have control over, but it works conversely with our, so, so we also have muscle in our bladder. The, we have a, um, it's called smooth muscle in our bladder that whenever we go to the bathroom or whenever we're whenever we're holding to go to the bathroom, we'll start with, you know, our bladders filled. Our, it sends, it sends our, sends our brain a signal that's like, Hey, I need to go to the bathroom, but I'm not ready yet. The, the muscle in our bladder stays relaxed. You know, it has to be able to expand to accommodate all of the, the fluid build up in there. And the pelvic floor muscles are the external pelvic floor muscles are contracting. Whenever we actually go to the bathroom, the bladder muscle actually contracts to help push out all the urine and the external and internal urethral sphincters have to relax. However, and I encourage you to try this the next time you really have to pee. What, and this goes into another diagnosis called urinary urgency and frequency. Like people have to pee really bad and they need to go right now. Otherwise they're going to pee themselves. This goes into urinary urge incontinence where you like, you have to pee so bad, but you can't hold it and you just, Either, you either leak yourself or you fully pee yourself. Um, but what I teach people and what a lot of, you know, a lot of pelvic floor therapists teach people is to actually relax your pelvic floor whenever you get that urge, because it's kind of like, now don't get, don't get me wrong. If you have a full bladder, if you've just drank an entire gallon of water, this technique or this, what I'm about to teach you may not necessarily work. It, it will help buy you time, but it's not gonna, you know, when, when we're, you can't go another hour in a car. Right. However, <laughs> if you just went to the bathroom, which I hear a lot of, you know, urinary urge, urgency, frequency in my clinic anyways. Um, if you've just gone to the bathroom and 20 minutes later, your bladder is like screaming at you that you have to pee again. This is when we're do, we do something called bladder retraining where I'm teaching people to relax their pelvic floor so that we can retrain their bladder that you're not in dire need. You're not about to pee yourself. You've still got time. You just emptied your bladder. It's kind of like, and I always tell equate it to like a crying kid in a candy store. If you give, you know, if your kid is screaming at you for a candy bar and you give into it, you're going to teach your kid that crying and throwing a fit and throwing a tantrum is okay because they'll get what they want. That same principle is applied to the bladder. You can retrain your bladder to teach it that we're not, you know, we're not going to die if we don't go to the bathroom right now. You have, you know, you can, we still have some time. But back to the anatomy of it, whenever I'm teaching patients to relax their pelvic floor, you have that internal urethral sphincter and your external urethral sphincter. And so it's kind of like a floodgate, that external urethral sphincter. It's not going to you're not just going to completely pee yourself if you relax your pelvic floor because you've got that floodgate that's keeping things closed. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So I, and I hear that What exactly lot. is, what exactly is, I think it makes sense to me, but I want to know what is the floodgate 
that internal urethral sphincter. The internal urethral. Okay. Cause I think that mentally, which is why I'm happy you also do like you work with the mindset of it. <laughs> I think mentally people automatically assume they, they don't know that they have that to rely on. So then right. that, that makes them give in to the temper tantrum, if you will. Right. And it's very common. It's, it's very common. And it, it's, you know, I went to, I have a four years of undergrad and, and three years of the, of the clinical doctorate in this field. So I know, and it makes sense to me, but you know, the common person that ha- doesn't have a similar background, it's completely, you know, it's not ludicrous to think that, you know, if you relax your pelvic floor, I'm just going to pee all over myself, but it's, it's not, it's, it's not that way. And mm. whenever you contract the pelvic floor muscles, it, it only increases that urgency symptom, that, that frequency symptom, it, it heightened because remember it, if you live at a 90% contraction, it, <laughs> I'm trying not to get like too much into the no, science of it, get, but no, like get into the science, go the, to the science. So you've got these neural pathways in your brain in your brain and in your bladder. And, you know, think of like a tree trunk with all of these tree branches and then all of these like little root systems. So these neural pathways in your, in your bladder, whenever your bladder fills, you've got, it's basically like four different, four different points in your bladder where it's like the first one, it's like something's in there, but nothing to be worried about. The second one's like, "Mm, something's in there, but we're still okay for now. The third one's like, something's in here and you pr- probably start looking for a bathroom soon. The fourth one is like, you need to go right now or we're going to pee all over the floor. And so these neural pathways, they, they kind of correlate to pelvic floor tension as you, as we just talked about, you know, the more your bladder fills, the more it creates this urgency of like, I need to pee right now. And so if you're contracting your pelvic floor, that is telling your brain that you are in a, you know, your nerve, your, <clears throat> your nervous system is broken down into two different segments. You've got a sympathetic nervous system and a parasympathetic nervous system. One is fight or flight. One is rest and digest. And if you're in a fight or flight mode, you get kind of really tense. And you get anxious and your heart, you know, your heart rate increases. Um, if you've ever had to pee really bad and you're nowhere near a bathroom, you probably have felt all of these symptoms of like, just you, you get really tense, your muscles want to contract. And so it just this, it's called Bradley's loop, this like neural pathway of like, it's kind of like a hamster wheel, you feel like you have to pee. So you contract your pelvic floor, the pelvic floor tells your brain that it's in a fight or flight state, which reinforces the the bladder. And it's this like loop of just anxiety of stress of feeling like you're about to pee yourself. And so to break that loop to break that cycle, you know, like I said, you've got the floodgate of your internal urethral sphincter. But you've also got your external urethral sphincter, that's your backup. And so if you can relax your pelvic floor, knowing that you're not actually going to pee yourself, because you've got this other mechanism, if you can relax your pelvic floor, and you can take a couple deep breaths, it resets that that neural pathway loop, it's kind of like throwing in a distraction, you're like distracting mm-hmm. your brain, and it throwing off your bladder. And you're like, Oh, we're not actually in in dire need, we're not actually about to pee ourselves. And so whenever I'm teaching bladder retraining to people, a lot of what I'm doing, again, is breathing, teaching them, you know, do a couple diaphragmatic breaths, relax your pelvic floor. And get to a point where these bladder, these urgency symptoms, they come in wavelengths. So if you've ever had to pee really bad, I want you to kind of pay attention to what happened, like what your bladder does. If you don't actually give in to that, that first urgency symptom, that urgency decreases. And so it comes in these wavelengths. And if you can ride out the waves, these peaks, you're going to get to another valley, you just have to be able to kind of push past that and trust that you're not going to leak or wet yourself. Um, And so being able to correctly breathe, being able to relax your pelvic floor, and get to a place where you can safely get to a bathroom. That's part of that's a lot of what I teach people whenever I'm whenever they're coming to me for urgency frequency symptoms. Our kids were born by surrogacy. um, And our surrogate 
she had um, a C-section. And, you know, and I know a lot of women, obviously, you have C-sections or, you know, they get vaginal births. And you spoke in the beginning about how they they get a script to say, here's, I think you said six weeks of physical therapy. You know, what, why? Like, what is happening to a woman during birth, regardless of how she gives birth, that requires or you think that they should really seek out to give themselves some, get themselves some physical therapy? Kind of going back to a, a sports orthopedic mindset, you know, if you've ever had a rotator cuff injury, or if you've ever torn your ACL in your knee, your doctor, your orthopedic surgeon or physician has no issue sending you to, to rehab, to physical therapy. It's much more conservative. Um, even if you have had to sur- have a surgery for your ACL, it's much more cost effective on the medical system to go through physical therapy than keep prescribing you a bunch of medications or having unnecessary surgeries. Um, the same, the same exact principle applies to having a baby. I mean, as, as wonderful as having a baby is, as wonderful as creating a new life and bringing it into the world, it's a traumatic experience on the body. It is a trauma, it is a trauma to the pelvic floor. Those, your muscles have to stretch, you know, 10, 50 times their natural size. And if you're giving a vaginal delivery, if you, heaven forbid, you tear, if you have, uh, you know, the, the space between the vaginal canal and the anus, it, it's graded on four different degrees. If you have a fourth degree tear, you pretty much have torn your entire perineum open from the vaginal canal into the rectum. Like it, there are no longer two, two holes. They have become one because you have torn so badly. And those patients, you know, they're, they get stitched up, they have an episiotomy, but again, like you wouldn't go get an ACL, you know, reconstruction. You wouldn't get your knee torn open and put back together and then not get physical therapy. It's just like not common practice. And so I, regardless of if you had a fourth degree tear or not, those muscles still have to stretch. It's the incidence of, you know, urinary incontinence or prolapse are very high and they correlate to the amount of, they can correlate to the amount of tearing that you have. And so It just baffles me that I don't know, I don't understand why a physician would be hesitant to refer to pelvic floor PT. And thankfully, a lot of the the physicians that I've been fortunate enough to partner with are very, very open and welcoming to pelvic floor PT, particularly like OBs and urogynes, um, urogynecologists. They are very most of the ones that I've worked with here in Atlanta are very open to pelvic floor PT. But like I said, at the very beginning, a lot of physicians, especially kind of older, older school physicians think of what we do as witchcraft and it's not necessary and you just need to do a bunch of Kegels and you'll be fine. And that's absolutely not the case. And it's infuriating whenever I get patients that come to see me having had physicians tell them that they just needed to do Kegels or they just needed to drink a glass of wine and it'll be fine. Like absolutely infuriating. And in, in Georgia where I'm at in Atlanta, we have direct access. So you don't need a, you don't need a physician's referral to come see a pelvic PT, you know, depending on the amount of time that you're seeing us, we have to consult with a physician. Um, but for your first appointment, at least, you don't need a physician's referral. And so, and actually, a lot of states have some some form of direct access where you can just go see a pelvic floor PT if you want to. Um, we work closely with physicians just because of the, the nature of the way our healthcare system is set up. Um, but it's not absolutely necessary to have a physician's referral to come see us. And so in the last, you know, pelvic floor PT isn't new. It's been around for decades, but just you know, just like as the times change, talking about penises and vaginas and sex has become less taboo. And so people are more willing to talk about what's happening to their bodies. And so pelvic floor PT has kind of become, I don't want to say revolutionized because that sounds tacky, but people are more open to come to coming to see a pelvic floor PT. I would say in the last 10 years, it's become 
more commonplace. Um, but even if you haven't had a vaginal delivery, even if you have had a C-section, oh, you know, they're still cutting your body open to get another human being out. And there's a lot of scarring that happens. And there are a lot of nerves that travel through the abdominal wall. And so even if you haven't had a vaginal delivery and they've still had to, they've done a C-section, I still would highly, highly encourage patients to still go see, at least see a pelvic floor PT once, you know, what's the harm in seeing someone and just at least getting screened to make sure that, you know, even patients with that have had C-sections still, I've had, I've treated patients that have prolapse or urinary incontinence. It, it's just, again, falls into that overactive pelvic floor. A lot of patients can't have vaginal deliveries because they have an overactive pelvic floor. They can't get out of that relaxed state to have a vaginal birth. And so I, I always encourage patients, even if you had had a, have had a C-section, like it would still behoove you to go see a pelvic floor PT. Ladies, listen to that um, <laughs> and, and, and go find a pelvic floor therapist specialist. Okay. Um, two more things. Uh, okay. One, let's talk about pain during penetration because, and I'm about to keep it very real here because I know you work with a lot of LGBT, a lot of the LGBTQ community. <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of guys out there who are like, you know, they think being, you know, the passive, like they in Europe, they say passive. In the States, they say the bottom, you know, whatever. If you're, or even if you're a female out there and you're having anal sex and you're receiving anal sex, people are like, oh my gosh, I'm not doing that. It's because it hurts. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, I mean, there's always, a, you know, some sort of window. But you say, but then there's also women who have vaginal pain during intercourse, correct? So correct. let's talk about pain during intercourse of all uh, areas, if you will. Um <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I mean, because I, for the longest time, you can ask Scott, I was like, nope, no, no, no. Or I would just be like, uh, like, you know, I would have anal sex as a receiver because I was like, I love my husband. But it wasn't until the pandemic when we had nothing to do. That I said, all right, this is going to be my time to get over this, hump, honey. Like, <laughs> you know, keeping it very real here today, love ladies it. and gentlemen. Love but that. I'm just like. And it wasn't never, for me, it wasn't anything about like, you know, a masculine thing. It was more about, well, this hurts, this hurts, this hurts. And I also, you know, because I had childhood sexual trauma, sexual abuse, I also had some uh, mental stuff that was going on with that, that I didn't work through all the way, you know, just because, you know, in terms of my sexual abuse, like my sexual abuser tried to, you know, rape me in that kind of way. And it was, it just completely ruined my mindset. So I had a lot to work through. Anyway, I'm talking a lot. I just wanted to give you some information around no, I why I'm it. interested in this topic. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, and unfortunately, it it's such a, it's just really shitty to be, oh, <laughs> to no, be honest. we can curse on this podcast. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's just, well, it, it is. It's just a really shitty thing that, sexual assault and rape is so prevalent because I would say a, a very large majority men and women that I treat um, have have had have experienced some form of sexual assault or trauma or rape and you know whenever you've had something so traumatic happen to your pelvic floor or try to happen to your pelvic floor whether we know it or not the body our body remembers things it, it, it remembers you know what the feelings that were associated with that instance. And so when that's why I work closely, very closely with a lot of sex therapists, a lot of like patient or a lot of therapists that can work through the mental side of things where I work through the physical side of things. Um, and so with pain with penetration, you know, it, it's not to say that everyone who has pain with penetration has been sexually assaulted or raped. That's not, that's not a fair statement, but it is a very high correlation. Um, and so it just kind of goes into that, that, that anxiety, that stress associated with this specific event. And so if you, if you have a lot of like mental hangups or, you know, a mental trauma associated with that, 
it's it can be very difficult to to separate that one instance from the rest of your sexual encounters for the rest of your life because if you had one negative experience it it just kind of flows into kind of seeps into the rest of your life and so to your point you know having you know anal sex penetration it it's really hard to detach those instances and if you can't relax your pelvic floor it absolutely is not going to be an enjoyable experience for you and so a lot of what i teach whether it's vaginal or anal penetration a lot of what i teach is just you know if you're working with a mental health therapist great if not <laughs> mental health is not my background but i i always tell patients like i'm a lowercase p capital t like i'm a pt but i'm mostly a therapist and so if you're working with me like i try to help you work through some of the head stuff and i try to help you figure out how to navigate your body in a way that you can relax the get out of that overactive pelvic floor state, relax your body enough to comfortably and feel safe enough to receive penetration. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that happens overnight. I'm going to be honest, whenever I'm doing particularly with pain with pain with penetration, a lot of what I'm doing is, you know, again, breathing, like figuring, f teaching patients how to get out of that overactive state, but also doing a lot of dilator training. So dilators are these, I have a, a company that I, that I really love and use. They have a, a regimented dilator set where the smallest dilator starts at like the size of my pinky and the largest one goes up to like five and a half inches in diameter and it's like eight inches long. And so those that those dilators are great and they're also coming out this company um, is also coming out with a rectal line so because you know us in the gay community anal sex is the only way we can receive penetration or give penetration and it's something that i've had i've thought been thinking about for a while but anyways they're coming out with a rectal line and i'm very excited about these dilators because you can graduate you can start with one size something that's comfortable non-threatening you can, it's just like doing a hamstring stretch, right? If you bend over and touch your toes and you have a lot of tightness and a lot of pain, you're not going to want to keep doing that. However, you're not going to get more flexible. You're not going to gain flexibility or range of motion if you don't ever stretch the hamstrings or work through that, that tightness. The exact same thing, the exact same principle applies to the pelvic floor, whether it's vaginally or rectally. It's all just a group of muscles that have the ability to expand. Um, it's just a matter of working through whatever your tightness is, whatever your level of tension is to progress to something that's more comfortable. And so that's what I love about these this dilator regimen, whether it's vaginal or rectal, you can use these dilators and you can progress from one size to the next. And, you know, obviously I'm there with you and I'm kind of coaching you and teaching you. We're going through all the breathing. We're going through all the stretching. We're going through all the lengthening and the down training. Um, but specifically for pain with penetration, specifically for, you know, anal, there's no like, I've, I've done a lot of research. There's no like, guidelines or like manual of like how to have comfortable sex particularly for gay men you know like if i would have known about this when i was 18 like or if i would have had something you know to kind of cue me or direct me like the first experience would have been a lot less terrible you know <laughs> like i feel like like talk just about it <laughs> sex in general just isn't talked about you know and nobody tells you as a you know when you're figuring things out exploring how to do it safely or comfortably and so this has been an idea of mine for a while but having just some sort of, sort of like book or manual or like you know i don't know i feel like would be really helpful for a lot of people to have pain-free sex, pain-free penetration. Write the book, Lance. It's in the, Write the book. It's in the making. Okay, good. <laughs> it's in the making. We'll have you back on once it's once published it's and I read it and I'll help okay. you sell it because, okay. <laughs> I, you know, I, I get it. You know, I wasn't comfortable having anal sex until I was 43 years old. So, and it has a lot, I think it has a lot to do with what we talked about, the mental space and even just the training of it. And, you know, in the gay community, they talk about it. Oh, I'm a power bottom. I'm like, well, good for you, bitch, because <laughs> I'm not, 
and right. I'm trying to be, you know, it's just like we go right. through all those things and, and maybe they've been able to relax and maybe they haven't had sexual trauma or, and even if it's women in rape, maybe they, you know, even if they're a lot of women, I know still have sex in a loving marriage. And because they've had past, past trauma, they don't like sex that often and they don't know why. And their spouse thinks that it's because they're not into them. And, you know, right. they go through all these problems. And I just think that visiting someone like you, ca- uh, lowercase p, capital T, uh, <laughs> yeah. even though it's a capital P, right. um, I just think it's, I think it's necessary. So when you write that book, we'll have you back on, but okay. I'm not letting you go yet. All right. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is, oh, there's so many things, but I, I, I think <laughs> just because of time, I want to talk about toxic masculinity and the vulnerability with that and penises like can we talk about that because it is a real thing and a lot of people don't even know what toxic masculinity is so can you just like really dive into that for me i want to say real quick but you can go as slow as you want it's not going to be real quick but i I will absolutely dive into it okay i mean so from a, a healthcare standpoint toxic masculinity is just this idea this headspace that men have to be you know, alpha, have to be macho, cannot show weakness, have to be best on top of everything. And a lot of those patients in my clinic are the ones that have the most problems. Whenever you, particularly in the healthcare setting, like no, nobody wants to be vulnerable. Nobody wants to admit weakness. Nobody wants to admit, you know, something is wrong with them. And I feel like in, in, in women and patients with vaginas, it's, it's a lot more accepted to seek out help. And it's, you know, women are more of the nurturers of the carers of, you know, are, are better at expressing their feelings and their emotions and what their wants and needs. I feel like men have to kind of keep that bottled up. It's been like in, 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 ingrained in society for particularly in the states but also you know everywhere globally but even more so i feel like in the states men cannot show weakness or it's it becomes a stigma um and so for a man to seek out help and admit that something is wrong with their particularly with their pelvic with their pelvic floor um it it's hard a lot of a lot of men just won't do it or they'll, I I have several patients have had several patients where their wife has like called and made the appointment or called and reached out and talked to me about their husband's problems because the husband didn't want to. And so it, it just goes to show that it's really, it can be really hard for men to be vulnerable and admit when something is wrong, whether it's, you know, any of the things that we've talked about today, erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, you know, pain with erections, pain with ejaculation, any kind of pain symptom. Um, It's, it's common, but it's not normal. I read a statistic the other day, I think it was sometime last week, that one in six men will experience pelvic floor dysfunction in their lifetime. And, you know, pelvic floor dysfunction is a large umbrella. So that can be, you know, all the things that I just mentioned can be more things that we haven't really talked about. But one in six men will experience pelvic floor dysfunction. And my my experience is that a lot of the men that have found me, I've, again, my practice is still very new. So I'm still in the the growing phase. I'm still getting patients. I'm still, you know, connecting with different referral sources. Um, But in the beginning, a lot of my patients came from, you know, Google search. A lot of my patients would find me online and they would come see me that way. I've done better at marketing myself and talking to different providers in the city. So I, I now get a lot of patients from a, from urologists, um, most of them being men, but even then they've been bounced around from provider to provider because nobody can really figure out what's wrong with them. And so that also just discourages them from seeking help. Like if, if they've gone to see their primary care doctor and they have, they've run all the tests, they've done all the whatever that they need to do and that, nobody can find anything wrong with them physically. It's very discouraging to keep asking for help when somebody tells you that nothing's wrong with you. It's in your head. I've had patients, you know, 
see five, six, I had one patient see 10 different providers before they finally got to me. And like, how discouraging is that to see 10 different people and all of them tell them there's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with them. When in actuality, like, you know, their pelvic floor is jacked. A lot of people don't want to admit. So they could go to the doctor and they're like, a doctor might ask them a question, but they're like, oh no, like, oh no, it's not that bad. Or, you know, so I think a lot of times they don't want to have that vulnerability and they feel like their masculinity is being diminished because especially if it has to deal with their penis or, you know, anything down there. Like, do you ever feel, do you ever have patients that have breakthroughs like literally in front of you? I have to be a supportive clinician. Like I have to create space for people to be vulnerable. Otherwise, you know, it's not just like going to see your ortho PT or going to see your trainer at the gym. Like this is a very intimate setting and I, I appreciate that. And so I have to hold a lot of space for people to feel safe enough and vulnerable enough to tell me all of the information. Because if, if patients are just telling me half-ass sort of answers, if they're kind of only half answering questions or if they're kind of skirting around what's actually happening to them, it makes it very hard to, to diagnose and also treat. But when, when patients really kind of let the let their walls down and really kind of step out of that that masculine kind of show no weakness or show no fear sort of personality it a lot more progress can be made and i've had i've had patients tell me and one last week he was like you know i've never told anybody any of this information he's like i've just kind of suffered in silence with it because i didn't know i didn't know who to talk to and the people that I asked or talked to dismissed it. So mm. it, and it just kind of goes back to our healthcare system in general and just how flawed the American healthcare system is. You know, physicians see upwards of 20, 30, 40 patients a day. They don't have a lot of time to spend with you. You, you get like five, maybe 10 minutes. They, you tell them what's wrong and they may have some follow-up questions, but generally they, they leave, they write you a script for a medication or something, a, a diagnostic test, and then you're done. So there's not a lot of space to create for patients to really kind of own that vulnerability and kind of express what's really happening, which is why I feel fortunate working for myself and working in the setting that I do, because I, for every new patient, it's an it's a ninety minute session. Every every patient gets ninety minutes mm -hmm. to just talk to me and kind of tell me what's going on. And I would say half to three fourths of that time is literally just spent talking. The rest is the exam. So it a lot of time is spent just listening and creating space for people to be vulnerable and tell me all of their experiences that they're having that that they think is related to what they're there for. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I just it does. went down a rabbit I mean, hole. It does. And you, and you have, you know, even while we're out having drinks, like you have such a calm and de like calm oh. spirit around you. That's why I kept being like, let's go down there to the bar and the music. Let me get you, <laughs> let me see what Lance has. But I mean, just even as a friend, you know, I could totally see how people would be able to feel comfortable and open up to you, which brings me to the next and final question you know i know you're in the atlanta area where can people find you and reach out to you and get in touch with you and i'll just give you this cta this call to action <laughs> ladies and gentlemen if you are in the atlanta area and you have experienced anything that lance's dr lance frank <laughs> has has talked about or even if you have some sort of concern i wholeheartedly you know would love for you to reach out to him. But anyway, where can they find you and how can they reach out to you? Yeah. Um, well, my website is a good place to start. Flexptatl.com is, that's the name of my business, Flexptatl. Um, but that has kind of all of my information, my background, scheduling an appointment. You can do all of that through my website. Um, you can also follow me on Instagram. Lance Frank is my personal page, but Flexptatl is my um, business page. And then TikTok has been, that's where I met you, Sean. TikTok has I been know. fun. And that is Lance in your pants. That's, <laughs> that's my username <laughs> on there. Seems fitting. <laughs> well, TikTok is the place to have a, a handle that's that's titled Lance in your pants. And I right. will say this. I think a lot of people will get a kick out of this story. I found Lance on TikTok. And 
he kept showing up on my for you page and i'm like why is this you know why is this doctor and i and i think that <laughs> one i do follow some doctors because you guys have like really great ways of you know being creative on TikTok, but in addition to you know i i tag lgbtq a lot and i think that you know the algorithm right but he kept showing up and i think i liked some of your posts but i never followed you and then i was like let me reach out to this guy and then <laughs> he told me he did my workouts and then we were <laughs> yeah. best friends ever since and we went right. out we met myself and he and his partner went out to uh dinner and i was like an hour late don't even <laughs> But I was getting my hair did. So late. I was okay. so late. We forgive oh you. God. We forgive you. That's the only reason why I was like, you want to come to my podcast? Maybe just to make up for it. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway, oh, Lance, man. thank you for helping my listeners trust and believe in the pelvic floor. I hope you guys got a lot out of this uh, informational session because that's what it was more than an interview. And uh, make sure you reach out to Lance and always trust and believe in who you are.